to share this glorious inheritance as we become co-heirs with Jesus. Lord, we just pray that tonight as we're here again, there might be that wonderful work of your Holy Spirit opening up the word to us, giving us understanding and inspiring our hearts, Lord, for a greater commitment of our lives to you. Teach us the things we need to know in order to live a successful Christian life. Lord, above all, may our lives be pleasing to you as we commit ourselves afresh and anew. And so now we ask your blessings upon your people that have gathered. Let their hearts be open and let them receive tonight from you, Lord, those things by which they will be strengthened. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The worship team will come and lead us in worship at this time. Stand together. Give you all my praise. 
new song tonight. Who is like him, the lion and the lamb, seated on the throne? Mountains bow down, every ocean roars to the Lord of hosts. Praise Adonai From the rising of the sun To the end of every day Praise Adonai All the nations of the earth All the angels and the saints Sing praise They sing praise like him, the lion and the lamb, you see it on the throne. The mountains bow down, and every ocean roars to the Lord of hosts. Praise Adonai, praise Adonai, from the rising of the sun to the end of every day. Praise Adonai. All the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise, they sing praise. Who's like him? Who's like him, the lion and the lamb, seated on the throne? Mountains bow down, mountains bow down, and every ocean roars to the Lord of hosts. Praise Adonai, praise Adonai, from the rising of the sun to the end of every day. Praise Adonai. All the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise, they sing praise, praise Adonai, praise Adonai, from the rising of the sun to the end of every day, praise Adonai, all the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise, they 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 sing Yeah. 
your heart for me Your love restores my home again Teach me, Lord, to rest with it Teach me, Lord, to rest with it Take my life and use it then. Oh, take my life and use it
the ushers will come forward at this time, we'll receive the evening tithes and offerings. Another full week, your bulletin will apprise you of everything that's going on here at Calvary Chapel through the week. We need to be in prayer. We are living in perilous times. We don't know what a week might bring forth. But we do know that the coming of the Lord is drawing close and we surely want to be where God would have us to be, doing the things that God would be having us to do in these last days. This week, a special event on Saturday from 9 till noon here at the church as we have a program for such a time as this. Very appropriate with the elections coming right around the corner. Dr. Alan Keyes will be the main speaker. Dr. James Dobson will be making a special video message for this particular service. And then Sherry Lush will be speaking. And uh, we will be really discussing uh, the condition of the nation and what we as Christians are called by God to do to remedy some of the problems. And so uh, we encourage you to be here Saturday from 9 to 12 for this special uh, program. On Friday night at the Maranatha movies, they are showing uh, this uh, movie, what's it called? The <laughs> you know what it is. <laughs> uh, the last couple of Friday nights, it's been quite full. In fact, this last Friday night, they even filled the gym also. And uh, it's a very exciting movie that deals with Tim LaHaye's book and uh, is dealing with the things of the last days, uh, the rapture of the church. I understand the movie's very well done. And so your opportunity, again, because we'll be having the same film this Friday night. Let's turn now to Numbers chapter 7. This brings up a interesting point as you study the scriptures, a point that often makes it difficult for us with a Western mindset to understand the scriptures as they were written. For we usually think of writing a book in a chronological order. But that is not the Hebrew style of literature in keeping things in a chronological order. Now, in the book of Exodus, we find them finishing the tabernacle. In the book of Leviticus, uh, we find at the end of chapter 9, the first sacrifices that were offered in the tabernacle, the inauguration of the tabernacle. Now here in Numbers chapter 7, we come back to the few days that preceded the beginning or the dedication of the tabernacle. In fact, the seventh chapter of the book of Numbers takes place one month before the first chapter of the book of Numbers. Uh, the first chapter of the book of Numbers takes place in the second month of the second year of their coming out of the bondage in Egypt. This takes place in the first month of the 
the first day of the first month of their coming out of Egypt and it is giving us now further details of events that have already been covered uh, and often in the scriptures you'll find that they will fill in details later on uh, they'll maybe just sort of pass over a, a particular event and then they'll come back and fill in details later on that event in the first chapter of the book of Genesis you have the overall creation seven days of creation beginning with the second chapter you come back and the writer is filling in details of the first chapter now the western mind and people thinking with the western mindset say well there are two accounts and of the creation in genesis and they're little contradictory no there's only one account you have the creation in chapter one and then you have further details filling in some spaces in chapter two as god deals with the method by which certain things were accomplished in creation so here we read it came to pass on the day that moses had fully set up the tabernacle so now we go back to exodus the setting up the tabernacle and to leviticus and had anointed it and, and that anointing uh, took place there in Leviticus and had sanctified it and all the instruments thereof both the altar and the vessels thereof and had anointed them and sanctified them now we are told uh, back in uh, the uh, book of, uh, of uh, Leviticus that this was on the first day of the first month of the second year coming out of uh, Egypt that the princes of Israel the heads of the house of their fathers who were the princes of the tribes and were over those that were numbered offered and we notice that they each brought the same offering the 12 tribes and the princes or the heads over those tribes brought offerings to be used in the dedication of the tabernacle and the service within the tabernacle and they brought them on successive days for 12 days each one bringing a similar sacrifice uh, for the uh, tabernacle but here in verse 3 the princes first of all bring uh, their offering before the Lord six covered wagons and twelve oxen a wagon for two of the princes so two tribes went together and got one wagon and each tribe offered an ox making a total of six wagons and twelve oxen and they brought them to Moses and the Lord said take them that they may be used to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation and you shall give them to the Levites to every man according to his service now there were basically the four families the family of Moses and Aaron the priestly family that offered the sacrifice there was the family of the Kohathites that carried the holy instruments of the temple on the poles. Uh, there was the uh, family of the um, Merorites who carried the lumber and the post, and the families or the family of Gershom who carried uh, the uh, curtains. Uh, and the coverings of the tabernacle so in distributing then to these families the carts the covered wagons and uh, the oxen the purpose of the covered wagons was to put the 
parts of the tabernacle in the wagons to be pulled by the oxen. Two oxen pulling, uh, or, uh, pulling actually a wagon. And because the um, Gershonites had the lighter burden of the curtains, the tapestries and all, they got two wagons and four oxen. Because the Merorites had the heavier load, the wood, the silver sockets, and uh, the various vessels that were used uh, in uh, the uh, ceremonies, the heavier load, they received four wagons and eight oxen. However, the Ark of the Covenant, the candlestick, the table of showbread and all, they were not to be carried in a cart, but they were to be borne on the poles so that the, they really didn't touch these uh, holy uh, instruments, but uh, the sons of Aaron would go in and set the staves through the rings and the Kohathites would come and carry them on their shoulders. Uh, they were not to be put in carts. Later on in the history of Israel, when the Philistines had captured the Ark of the Covenant, when in a time of spiritual declension, uh, the Israelites under Saul uh, had, uh, or rather under uh, the time of Samuel, when the people had turned away from the Lord, they sought to take the Ark of the Covenant into battle against the Philistines, thinking that there would be some kind of magical protection if they would take the Ark of the Covenant into battle. And when the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant coming into battle, they began to shout and yell, and the Philistines sort of panicked, and they uh, attacked the Israelites, and they took the Ark of the Covenant. But it was a bane to the Philistines. Everywhere they took the Ark of the Covenant, the men of the city would break out with boils all over their bodies. And so when they tried to bring it uh, to one of the Philistine cities, they said, oh no, you're not going to bring that thing to us. You're not going to dump that off. And so they decided that they would send it back to Israel. There was no place that they could keep it. It was a real uh, burden to them. And so they put it in a cart and they put a couple of milk cows on the cart and the men of Beth Shemesh heard these cows as they were sort of lowing and they looked and here was the cart with the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, they uh, put it there uh, at uh, Kiriath Jerem. And later on, David decided to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to uh, Jerusalem. It stayed there in Kirjath Jerim for quite a while, but David decided he would bring it to Jerusalem. And you remember that David put it in a cart and he was not following the biblical pattern for the carrying or the bearing of the Ark of the Covenant. And he did as the Philistines, he put it in a cart to bring it to Jerusalem. And as they were coming, the cart hit a rut, started to tilt. And one of the fellows reached out to steady uh, the uh, ark. And uh, in touching it, uh, the Lord killed him. And David stopped the procession. And he went back and he said, can't handle that thing. But then later on, he decided to bring it to Jerusalem again. But this time he went to the priest and he got the instructions. 
And so they put the staves in and the priest bore the Ark of the Covenant as is commanded here in uh, the Pentateuch. And uh, they brought it with sacrifices back to Jerusalem and set up the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. So uh, no oxen, no carts, or no wagons for uh, the Kohathites who were to carry uh, the uh, golden candlestick, the uh, golden Ark of the Covenant, and the table of showbread, uh, or the altar that was in the front and the labor. These were born uh, between them. So... Uh, Then the princes of the people brought the offerings for the dedication of the tabernacle. And each of the princes and each day successive, uh, in succession, uh, consecutive days, brought their offerings. Each offering consisted of a silver charger weighing three pounds and of a silver bowl weighing about two pounds. They were both filled with fine flour and oil for the meal offering. They each brought a gold spoon that was filled with incense weighing about four ounces. And they each brought one young bullock one ram, one lamb of the first year for the burnt offering, and then one goat for the sin offering, and then two oxen, five rams, five goats, five lambs for the peace offering. And on the first day of the 12 consecutive days, Judah, uh, the tribe of Judah offered their uh, offering the second day Ishkar, the third day Zebulun, the fourth day Reuben, the fifth day Simeon, and then the tribe of Gad, the tribe of Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin, Dan, and Asher, and Naphtali. And uh, then at the end of chapter 7, you find them totaling up uh, the total amount of uh, offerings that were brought by each tribe. Now, it would seem to me that it would have been easier if the Lord had just said ditto. Uh, but in each case, he lists each of the offerings. Uh, and uh, so it makes a long chapter. In fact, this is the second longest chapter in the Bible. Uh, the only longer chapter, of course, is Psalm 119. And so... Uh, uh, they total up then all of the offerings that were brought for the 12 days of dedication. So we get to chapter 8, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and say unto him, When you light the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. And so Aaron did so. He lighted the lamps and... Uh, the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses, and this work of the candlestick was of beaten gold under the shaft thereof, under the flowers thereof, and it became a beaten work according to the pattern that the Lord had shown Moses, so he made the candlestick. So uh, again, we're going back over the uh, dedication of the tabernacle and the things that they did, the lighting uh, of these, uh, of the candle, uh, of the candles which were of course the representative of the intention of God that uh, he be a light of the world and that through the nation of Israel God's light might shine forth to the world and so the Lord spoke unto Moses saying take, take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them they are to do the service of the Lord and to do the service of the Lord, there needed to be a cleansing. All of us are sinners. The Levites were sinners. And none of us really have any right to serve the Lord apart from being cleansed. Jesus said, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. He said, as we begin to bring forth fruit, the Father washes it, purges it, that it might bring forth more fruit. 
And so that cleansing of God's spirit uh, of our lives in order that we might be fit to serve the Lord. And so they are to sprinkle the water of purifying upon them. Let them shave all their flesh. Let them wash their clothes and so make themselves clean. Then let them take a young bullock uh, with his meal offering, even fine flour mingled with oil, and another young bullock shall you take for the sin offering. And you shall bring the Levites before the tabernacle of the congregation, and you'll gather the whole assembly of the children of Israel together. This is, of course, uh, they're, they're getting ready to begin the services uh, within the tabernacle, and so the whole multitude gathered. And thou shalt bring the Levites before the Lord, and the children of Israel shall put their hands on the Levites. Now, of course, it would be impossible for all of them to do so, but probably the representatives of each tribe, and no doubt the princes that have brought the offerings for their tribes. And Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord for an offering of the children of Israel that they may execute the service or do the service of the Lord. And the Levites shall lay their hands on the bullocks and they shall offer one for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering to the Lord to make the atonement for the Levites. And you shall uh, set the Levites before Aaron and before his sons and offer them for an offering unto the Lord. Now you remember Moses did this for Aaron and his sons. Now Aaron and his sons are to do it to the Levites. And uh, this is dedicating themselves as servants to the Lord. And you're to separate then the Levites from among the children of Israel. And the Levites, God said, shall be mine. And after that, the Levites will go in and do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. And you will cleanse them and offer them for an offering. For they are wholly given unto me from among the children of Israel instead of those that open every womb and the firstborn of the children of Israel which I've taken unto me. Now originally God said the firstborn of all of the children of Israel belong to me. Your firstborn son belonged to God. And he was to be the priest of the family, the firstborn son. However, in time, God changed it and he took the tribe of Levi. And the number of the tribe of Levi was very close to the number of the firstborn of the Israelites. And so rather than taking the firstborn of every family, God said, I'll just take the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Levi will be mine uh, and they will uh, do the service of the Lord. And uh, the Lord had claimed the firstborn of the families because they had been spared when the Lord passed through Egypt and killed the firstborn of every, every family. The Israelites were spared with the blood on the doorpost. And thus the Lord said, the firstborn are mine. I've sanctified or set them apart for myself. But I've taken now the Levites for all of the firstborn of the children of Israel. And I've given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and to his sons among the children of Israel to do the service of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation and to make the atonement for the children of Israel that there is no plague uh, among the children of Israel when, uh, that it, when they come near the sanctuary. Approaching God was a serious business. And at that time, there was no direct approach to God for the common man. And that is what the priest became, a mediator, a go-between, a daysman, 
who would represent God to the people and represent the people to God. The people couldn't come directly to God. And so these men were dedicated unto the service of God so that the people would come to the priest and they would go in turn unto God for the people. Lest the people actually coming would be destroyed. The holy God, and, and that's something I don't think we fully comprehend, the absolute holiness and purity of God. And how can that be mixed with sinful man? And so the go-between, the priest, lest the plague break out on the people when they sought to approach God. And Moses and Aaron and all of the congregation of the children of Israel did to the Levites according to what the Lord had commanded Moses. And they were purified, they washed their clothes, Aaron offered them as an offering before the Lord, and he made atonement for them to cleanse them. And after that, they went the Levites to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation before Aaron. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this is it that belongs unto the Levites from 25 years old and upward. They shall go in to wait on the service of the tabernacle of the congregation until the age of 50 years. Uh, they shall cease waiting upon the service thereof and they shall serve no more. Uh, but shall minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of the congregation to keep the charge and do the service. When you got over 50, you didn't have to work anymore. <laughs> you got to just supervise. Say, okay, now you fellows roll up that tent over there and you, know, and, and you supervised it, uh, but you didn't have to. From 25 years to 50 years, uh, when the cloud would move and the tabernacle had to be uh, taken down and moved. Uh, then uh, that you, you had to be 25 to 50 years old uh, to be involved in that service after the dedication of, your, of yourself. Interesting uh, to actually serve in the sacrifices. It was from 30 years old to 50 years old. Uh, to carry uh, or to, you know, to dismantle the tabernacle and involved in the moving of it, that was from uh, 25 years old to 50 years. Now, remember that there are several thousand of these from this, these families who were involved in moving the tabernacle. So with as many people as they had as uh, the laborers when the tabernacle was to be moved they could probably dismantle it in about 30 minutes and when they had to set it up they could probably set it up in 30 minutes uh, because you had so many people uh, involved in the labor so that it wasn't really a uh, very heavy duty Jesus said my yoke is easy my burden is light and and so uh, you think of the task but if, if you had just one board uh, to set in the silver socket and you had one fellow setting down the silver socket and you had to only carry one board and you had enough guys that each guy only had to carry one board and then the guys would uh, had the uh, staves to go through to hold the boards up and then you had fellows several of them putting the various coverings over the top. And so it could be done in a short period of time because the number of people you had involved in the service. One further issue on the ages, and that is uh, when the children of Israel have been rejected by God, and we'll get that in a few chapters, from going into the promised land because of their unbelief. They had said, if we try to go in and take the land that God has promised, our children will be praised, they'll destroy us, we can't do it. 
And so God said the children from 20 years old and down will go in, but you will all die in the wilderness. You won't be able to go in, but your children 20 years and under will go. That could be an indication that God accounts the age of accountability may be at around 20 years. Now surely a person can accept and walk with Jesus Christ before 20 years of age. But the interesting thing is that when God set the age for those that uh, were not accountable for the murmuring and the complaining and saying we can't go in, he set the age at 20. Those under 20 were not held responsible. Those that were over 20 were held responsible for that uh, decision. So in chapter 9, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. In the first month of the second year, after they were come out of the land of Egypt. And so uh, uh, this is... Uh, at the time of the dedicating of the tabernacle, they were uh, the tabernacle was first erected in Sinai. And they stayed in the area of Mount Sinai for a whole year. Uh, or just a couple of weeks, actually. Uh, well, actually, for a whole year in Sinai before they moved on. So in the first month of the second year, this is the month in which they are to celebrate uh, the Passover. The first of the month, they began the dedication of the tabernacle. And it was a 12-day affair as each of the princes brought the offerings for each day. God said, let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. And the 14th day of the month in the evening, you shall keep it in his appointed season according to all of the rituals and according to all the ceremonies you shall keep it so Moses spoke to the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover and they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month in the evening in the wilderness of Sinai and at evening in the wilderness according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses so the children of Israel did and there were certain men who were defiled by a dead body. Someone had died and they buried them. Actually, they had, and continue to the present day, have a policy among the Jews in Israel of burying the person the day they die. They don't embalm people. They don't uh, really have a, a time of viewing. But when a person dies, they take them out and bury them immediately. And so uh, uh, there were certain men who had no doubt had the duty of burying a dead person. And because of touching a, a dead body, they were ceremonially unclean and thus could not participate in the worship on the day of Passover. And so they came to Moses and Aaron on that day. And those men said unto him, We've been defiled uh, because of a dead body. And thus we were held back from observing the Passover. We can't offer the offerings to the Lord in this appointed season. And so Moses said to them, Stand still. And we'll hear what the Lord has to say concerning this. You know, this is a wonderful thing. Moses doesn't just make a decision, but he says, wait, and let me inquire of the Lord. Let's see what the Lord has to say about this. How important it is for the church today to defer all of the decisions to Jesus Christ. For the Bible tells us that Jesus is the head of the body, the church. And rather than just making decisions when issues arise, 
how important it is to ask the direction from the head of the church, Jesus Christ. Lord, what would you have us to do in this circumstance? Lord, how do you want us to handle this situation? And so Moses said, wait a minute, let's inquire of the Lord and see what he has to say about this. And so the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, if any of you or your posterity will be unclean by reason of a dead body or be in a journey afar off and you'll not be able to keep the Passover unto the Lord. The 14th day of the second month at evening, they shall keep it and shall keep it with the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break any bone of it. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. So uh, it was determined by the Lord that uh, if you were unable to do it on the actual day, that a month later you then could uh, observe the Passover feast. But then if you didn't have an excuse, uh, if you said, well, the World Series was on and I <laughs> wanted to stay and watch it, uh, that was not an acceptable excuse. And so uh, the man that is clean, not on a journey, and doesn't keep the Passover, even the same will be cut off from among his people because he brought not the offering of the Lord in the appointed season that a man shall bear his sin. And if the stranger sojourns among you and keeps the Passover unto the Lord according to the ordinance of the Passover according to the manner thereof, so shall he do. And you shall have one ordinance both for the stranger and for him that was born in the land. And now they... Uh, the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony. And at evening was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. A cloud by day, fire by night, rested on the tabernacle. And so it was always. The cloud covered it by day, the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed, and in the place where the cloud abode, the children of Israel pitched their tents. So the first thing the Levites would do in the morning is look out of their tents to see if the cloud was moving. If it was, they knew they had a busy day. They had to go and dismantle the tabernacle and they then followed the cloud. And when the cloud would stop, then they would have to pitch the tabernacle. And uh, so when the cloud abode from evening unto the morning, and when the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they journeyed. Whether it was by day or night that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. Or whether it were two days or a month or a year that the cloud tarried, Upon the tabernacle they remained. And the children of Israel stayed in their tents, did not journey, but when it was taken up, they journeyed. So they were being guided and directed by God. They moved when God indicated time to move by following the cloud and following the pillar of fire. And some days they would stay in an area for just one day, Sometimes a week may be in an area. Sometimes as long as a year. But they were being guided and led directly by the Lord. And again, how important for the church to be guided and led directly by the Lord. And when the Lord moves, God help us to move with him. And when the Lord isn't moving, God help us to just rest and not try and get out and do things on our own, but to follow completely the leading of the Lord. So important for the church. And so 
Uh, at the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents. At the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. And they kept, kept the charge of the Lord and the commandment of the Lord at the hand of Moses. Now, the Lord in chapter 10 ordered Moses to make two silver trumpets. And they were to be made of one piece of silver. They, they were just uh, the whole thing of, of silver molded into a trumpet. And uh, they were used for the calling of the assembly of the people. So when they will blow with the trumpets, the uh, people shall assemble themselves unto you at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, they would blow the trumpets with different sounds. Just like in the military, it used to be the bugler would sound uh, the various sounds of the bugle. One would indicate time to eat, and another one would indicate the mail call. Another one would indicate to retreat, another one to charge. And, and so, uh, and of course, one to uh, honor the dead. And uh, so the trumpet in Israel was used for different purposes. To sound an alarm for the people to go to war. Or to sound for the people time to move. Or another sound of the trumpet is time to assemble together at the tabernacle before the Lord. So uh, he speaks about blowing the alarm. Uh, then uh, the camps that are on the east side are to move forward. And when you blow the alarm the second time, the camps that lie on the south side will take their journey. And uh, when the congregation is to be gathered together, you shall blow and not sound the alarm. It would be a different sound of the trumpet. And the sons of Aaron and the priests shall blow with the trumpets, and they that shall be with you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And so the trumpet, hailing the people to come and to worship the Lord, or to go forward and move, uh, or actually to go out into battle and to uh, go against the enemy. So if you go to war, in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. Also in the day of your gladness, and in your solemn feast, in the beginnings of the month, you will blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings that they may be unto you for a memorial before your God, for I am the Lord your God. So trumpets, calling them to worship, calling them to move, calling them to go to war. And it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month of the second year. So now we have moved... Uh, from uh, the, uh, a, a month and 20 days beyond chapter 7. Uh, that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of the testimony. Time now to move out of the area of Mount Sinai. The children of Israel took their journey out of the wilderness of Sinai and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. And they took first their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. And the first place went the standard of the camp of the children of Judah with their armies and over the host uh, was a nation. And uh, then uh, they followed that with the tribe of Eshkar. And then it was followed by the tribe of Zebulun. And uh, then uh, by the a uh, tribe of Reuben, uh, but uh, in between uh, they had uh, the, uh, after the tribe of uh, Zebulun, uh, the family of Gershon followed with the two carts that held all of the curtains of the tabernacle. And of course they would be the first things that they could dismantle would be the curtains. 
And then the tribe of Judah, or rather the tribe of uh, Reuben and Simeon and Gad and they were followed by the family of Kohath and that would be carrying the Ark of the Covenant and the golden candlestick the holy vessels of the tabernacle and then they were followed by the tribes of Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin Dan, Asher and Naphtali so again uh, the tabernacle is sort of in the center uh, of the uh, of, of the uh, march uh, again always keeping the idea of God's presence in the center of his people and surely God wants us to know that he is with his people and he's in the midst of his people and uh, there was that constant reminder to them of God's presence in their midst in the book of Revelation John saw the seven golden candlesticks and Jesus was walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks the presence of the Lord in the midst of his church Jesus said where two or three of you are gathered together in my name there I am in the midst and so uh, the Lord went before them three days journey to search out a resting place for them and the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day as they went out of the camp and it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said rise up Lord let your enemies be scattered and let them hate that hate thee flee before thee and when it rested he said return O Lord unto the many of the thousands of Israel so when it would move he'd say rise up Lord let's move on when it rested he said Lord return to your rest interesting thing here uh, they departed from the mount of the Lord for three days journey and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days journey to search out a resting place for them in the book of Deuteronomy towards the end God said that he went before them in the wilderness and prepared the places for them to pitch their tents I like that what God is saying is that you never arrive at a place but what I haven't preceded you and prepared that place for you there's no experience that you come to in your life but what the Lord hasn't preceded you gone before you and prepared the place he said for you to pitch your tents so you have here an interesting thing God not only goes before you to prepare the place for you to pitch your tent but he also prepares you for the place that he has prepared for you to pitch your tent and so God works in me he is preparing me for the events that are ahead that I don't know about I'm still journeying through the wilderness God leads me through life I don't know where God will settle me next but I know that God goes before me to prepare the place I don't know what circumstances I might be facing in the future God knows he goes before me to prepare but in the meantime God is working in me as he is preparing me as Paul wrote to the Ephesians you are his workmanship or God is working in you to prepare you for the good works that he has before ordained that you should walk in them Paul is just sort of summarizing what we have here where God has going, is going before them to prepare the places for them to camp for them to pitch their tent and in the meantime he's preparing them for that place oh how wonderful is the work of God so when the people then <laughs> wouldn't it be wonderful to read and the people rejoiced in the Lord 
worshiping God and praising the Lord, but unfortunately that's not the case. The people complained and it displeased the Lord and the Lord heard it and his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. God hates complaining. You might think about that <laughs> if you're prone to complaining. And if you send your letters of complaint to me, <laughs> I just turn them over to the Lord. I say, Lord, look what they're saying now. <laughs> and the people cried unto Moses. And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. Here they are out there complaining and all, and God sends a fire. And the people come to Moses. Moses prayed, and the fire is quenched. And he called the name of the place Taberah which means burnings, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them. Now we read in Exodus that as they went out from Egypt, there went out with them a mixed multitude. These were people who were of mixed parentage. Part Egyptian, part Israeli. Uh, we read in Leviticus that a young man whose mother was an Israelite but whose father was an Egyptian blasphemed the Lord, the mixed multitude, not fully committed, not fully a part of God's people, but sort of fringe people, people around the edges. And usually those are the people that do complain. Those who are totally with what God is doing and, you know, moving along with the Lord rarely complain. They're so excited and so busy about the things of the Lord. You really don't uh, notice anything to complain about. But the mixed multitude hanging on the fringes, looking over with a critical eye, were given to complaints. And so the mixed multitude fell a lusting. And the children of Israel, they, and it spread. And there's one thing about that kind of a, a spirit. It spreads. Uh, you get a few disgruntled people and they can get a whole series of, of, of people sort of dissatisfied. And, oh, wow, I didn't realize it. My, that is horrible, isn't it? You know, and, and, and the thing just has a way of spreading. In, in a few chapters, we will come to this fellow, Korah. Now, he was of the Kohathites. He was of that tribe that was close to uh, the, the holy instruments because they carried them. But he got together with some of the others and he began to say, you know, that Moses fellow... He's taken too much upon himself. Who did he make the priest, the high priest, his brother? You see, we are Levites, and we have every much a right to go in and offer the incense and offer the sacrifices as do the sons of Aaron. Moses has taken too much upon himself. And, and they began to, he began to stir up and even spread out in the tribe of Reuben and so forth. And they're saying, yeah, yeah, 
What is that Moses think he is? Who does he think he is? What does he think he's doing? And he stirred up a whole bunch of guys against Moses. And here the mixed multitude. They start complaining, but soon the Israelites are also complaining. They began to lust. The children of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we ate in Egypt freely. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Now it describes the manna. It was like a coriander seed, the color of uh, bedillium. And uh, the people would gather it on the ground. It was on the ground in the morning. And they would grind it in, in their mills. They would uh, beat it with mortar. And they baked it in pans. They made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like the taste of fresh oil and a little bit of sweetness to it. And, and they were able to do many things with it uh, as far as uh, a... a <laughs> You know, you could have manicotti and you could have uh, many different things that you could uh, make out of manna. Uh, but the people were complaining and lusting after meat. When are you going to give us meat to eat? When the dew fell in the camp at night, the manna fell upon it. And so Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families. Every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses also was displeased. And Moses came to the Lord. And he said, Lord, why have you afflicted your servant? How is it that I have not found favor in your sight that you laid the burden of all of these people on me? Lord, why do you hate me? <laughs> what have I done to deserve this? Have I conceived all of these people? Have I begotten them that they should say to me, carry them in your bosom like a nursing father bears a nursing child into the land which you swore to their fathers? Where could I get flesh to give to all of these people? For they are weeping unto me saying, give us flesh that we may eat. I'm not able to bear all of these people alone. It's too heavy for me. And if you're going to deal with me like this, just kill me. <laughs> I mean, he's had it. I pray out of, the, out of hand, and if I have found favor in your sight, then let me not see my wretchedness. Moses is pouring out his heart to the Lord. He's, he's really quite obviously upset. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, respected men, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they might stand there with you. And I will come down, and I will talk with you there. And I will take of the spirit which is upon you and I will put it upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you bear it not by yourself alone. And so the 70 elders and this group of 70 elders continued throughout the history of the nation. In fact, at the time of Christ, the 70 elders were known as the Sanhedrin. And so, say to the people, sanctify yourself, 
For tomorrow you're going to eat flesh. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who will give us flesh to eat? And it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and you shall eat. But not for one day, or two days, or five days, or ten, or twenty. But even for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and is loathsome unto you because you have despised the Lord which is among you and you've wept before him saying why did we come forth out of Egypt so Moses said the people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen wait a minute Lord you said you're going to give them meat for a whole month and you said, I'll give them flesh that they may eat for a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all of the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? Moses made the mistake that we so often make with the promises of God. And that is we stagger at the promises of God because we try to figure out in our own minds how God could possibly do such a thing you remember at the time when the city of Samaria the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel had been under siege for a long period of time and as the result of the siege the people began to starve to death in Samaria it got so bad that they began to cannibalize two mothers made a covenant that they would eat their babies and the one mother ate gave her baby they boiled it and ate it and the next day the mother hid her child and so the one mother went to the king and said help king I want justice he said what's your problem he said we made this covenant to eat our babies and we ate my baby yesterday and she's supposed to produce hers for today and she's hidden it. And the king ripped his clothes and he said, God help me if I don't get that prophet. And he was blaming the prophet of God for the calamity that they were facing because the prophet had prophesied this calamity. And so... He sent his men down to take Elisha the prophet. But as we've already looked at Elisha, he was a man who had great discernment. God spoke to him all the time about everything. He probably was a very interesting fellow to be around. Because as you're talking to him, sometimes he'd just sort of go, go off and say, Oh, wow. Can you believe that? Oh, man. You know, what's going on? So here he's sitting with his friends and he goes into one of these things and they say, what's going on? And he said, oh, look what that son of a murderer is going to do now. He's sending guys down here to arrest me. And so when the fellows knock on the door, you fellows open the door and pin the fellow with the door because the king is coming right behind him. So there was a knock on the door and Elisha's friends opened and pinned the fellow behind the door. And pretty soon the king came riding up with the prime minister. And the king said, you've troubled Israel enough. And Elisha said, you've got that one wrong. You're the one that's troubled Israel. You've brought in the worship of the false gods and all. But don't worry. Tomorrow they'll be selling a bushel of fine flour in the gates of Samaria for 65 cents. Now they have been selling the jawbone of a donkey for 65 pieces of silver. They've been selling a quarter of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Now the prophet says tomorrow they'll be selling a bushel of fine flour for 65 cents. And this man, the prime minister upon whom the king leaned, mocked the prophet of God. He said, if God would open windows in heaven, could such a thing be? Elisha said, you'll see it, but you won't eat it. 
but he staggered at the promises of God. Now here is Moses staggering at the promises. God, <laughs> how are you going to do that? Do you want me to order them to kill all of their herds and eat them? Are you going to bring all of the fish of the sea and dump them on the shore? And God just said to Moses, my hand is not shortened. What God has promised, he is able also to perform. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think. God's hand isn't shortened. God is able to do it. And so Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people. And he set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it to the 70 elders. And it came to pass when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not stop. Now in the Old Testament, the sign of the spirit was the gift of prophecy being exercised. And uh, that was the, the sign by which they identified those upon whom the Spirit of God had fallen. So here are the 70 elders, and God takes the Spirit that was upon Moses, and now he puts his Spirit upon the 70 elders, that they might stand with Moses and be a strength to Moses, and to help Moses in bearing the burden of all of these people. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the other was Medad. And someone came in and they said, Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, who was the young servant of Moses, said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Are you envious for me and for my sake? Would to God that all of the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would put his spirit upon them. <laughs> Moses thought, Don't stop them. No way. I wish the spirit of God was upon the whole camp of Israel. It'd stop a lot of the complaining the murmuring and all of the problems that we have. Would to God his spirit was upon all. Now it is interesting that in the Old Testament the spirit came upon certain people but not upon all of them. And yet the prophet Joel by the spirit of God saw the day when the Lord said, it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my servants and my handmaidens will I pour out of my spirit in that day, saith the Lord. On the day of Pentecost, when God gave the gift of the Holy Spirit to the fledgling church, actually it was the birth of the church, when the people in Jerusalem who had come for the feast of Pentecost heard what was going on, they gathered together. And when they saw the people praising God and glorifying God in the various dialects, from which they had come. They were amazed. They were in wonderment. They said, what's going on? Are not all of these that are speaking Galileans? How is it that we're hearing them speaking in our own languages, our own dialects, as they are declaring the wonderful works of God? Others in the crowd, and there are always those that are there, and they began to sort of mock, and they said, oh, they probably found some wine someplace. And they're drunk. 
And so Peter stood up in the midst and he said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. These men are not drunken as ye suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel when he said, In the last days I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, saith the Lord. And he quoted for them the prophecy of Joel. So what Moses envisioned and dreamed how wonderful it would be is a possibility for the church that God's spirit would be poured out upon all. And in the early church in the book of Acts, it seemed that that was indeed the case, the spirit of God working in all of their hearts and lives. And I believe that it is God's desire and purpose that that be the case of the church, that each of us be filled with the Spirit, each of us walk in the Spirit, each of us be led by the Spirit, His Spirit upon us all. And so Moses wasn't jealous that God's Spirit was going upon others. He wished it was upon all of them. So then the promise of the meat. There came forth a wind from the Lord. It brought quail from the sea. And it let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and on a day's journey on the other side round the camp. And as it were two cubits high. Now it doesn't mean that the quails were piled two cubits high but actually they were flying in at about 36 inches high. And so they went out and they began to bat at these quail coming in. Perfect height for it. <laughs> batting. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day and they gathered the quail and they that gathered the least gathered 10 homers. Uh, now, as I told you, it's perfect batting height. <laughs> and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. A homer is 10 bushels approximately. So the person that gathered the least gathered 100 bushels of quail. That's ugly greed and unbridled lust. Nobody needs that much meat. And of course, they had to cook it in order to preserve it. And they started stuffing themselves with the meat. Horrible sight of unbridled lust. And we read, while the flesh was between their teeth before it was chewed, the wrath of God was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And so he called the name of that place Kibroth Hata'avah, because there they buried the people that lusted. Kibroth Hata'ava means the grave of lust. What a horrible grave to be buried in. But how many people are being buried today in the grave of lust? Because they have not and will not control their lust, their lust ultimately destroys them. And there are multitudes of people being destroyed today by lust because lust is such a destructive thing. Scores of families being destroyed by lust because one of the couples begins to lust after another relationship. Families are destroyed. Lives are destroyed. And the people journeyed from Kibroth Hata'ava to Hazeroth, and they abode in Hazeroth. 
So the tragic and sad story of God giving them their request, but giving them leanness of soul. You can't have both. You can't serve the flesh and serve the spirit at the same time. The flesh is warring against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary. A warfare going on inside of each of us. As our flesh is lusting against the spirit. Our flesh is wanting to control our lives. But the moment you are controlled by your flesh, you are being destroyed. The worst thing you can do for your flesh is to feed it. Because it doesn't satisfy it to feed it. It only cause, causes the lust to grow. Lust when fed grows. Need I illustrate it? When a person is starting off, say on heroin, it doesn't take much for that person to get a real rush. But the longer they are on heroin, the more heroin it takes to get that same rush. And so as they feed that lust, the lust grows until ultimately it seems they OD on the heroin. It destroys. These people lusting, given over to their lust, and they were being destroyed, and they were buried in the graves of lust. Sad, sad commentary. May it not be true of any of us. They that walk in the Spirit shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh the answer walking in the spirit Paul said to the Ephesians don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit why is a person drinking why does he get inebriated with wine because he's searching for something Something that will fulfill a void in his life. Something that will bring him sort of meaning. He's searching. There's an emptiness. He's trying to fill it. What happens when you're filled with the Spirit? Out of your innermost being, there flows rivers of living water. No longer just sucking in, but now giving out. What a difference. Interesting that Paul would associate two so disassociative things. And yet there is an association because the person filled with the Spirit has discovered what the person who is drinking is searching for and will never discover. Oh, how rich and how wonderful it is to walk in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit and not to be given over to the flesh and the lust thereof. Paul warns us about the world. It will pass away in the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. Father, we want to dedicate ourselves afresh to you tonight. And Lord, even as Moses envisioned how wonderful it would be if your spirit was upon all of them. So we thank you, Lord, for these days when the gift of the Holy Spirit is available for all. When you promise that you would pour out your spirit upon all flesh. And so, Lord, pour out your spirit upon us, we pray. In these last days, Lord, when evil days are waxing worse and worse, 
and people are giving themselves over to the flesh their unbridled lust being caught up in all of these things that are so destructive Lord keep us pure keep us holy keep us walking in the spirit that we would not fulfill the lust of our flesh. Help us, Lord. We want to be everything that you would have us to be in these last days. We want to be the witness to the world that you'd have us to be. Let our light so shine before men that as they see the good works, they will glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here in the front of the church tonight again for the specific purpose of praying for your needs. The Bible says the two or three of us agree on earth concerning anything that will be done by our Father in heaven. And so they're here to agree with you for the requests and the needs that you have in your life tonight. And so if you are going through a problem, if there is a, a situation that you're going to be facing this next week that you have real apprehensions about, maybe an operation or whatever, come on down and let them pray for you. They, they, they want to minister to you. It is the joy and the delight to be able to minister to God's people. And so, as soon as we're dismissed, we would encourage you to come forward. They'll be waiting to pray for you and to pray with you that God might work mightily in your life. Maybe that some area you've been feeding the flesh and your lust and it's taken over and you now find that you haven't control anymore but you are being controlled by your lust you like deliverance they'll be glad to pray for you tonight and you can experience God's help and God's deliverance he wants to work all you have to do is give him the opportunity I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your 